I'm very pleased to say that the Transport Secretary, Grant Shapps, joins us once again on the programme. Good to see you this morning, Mr Shapps. A, a busy few days uh, ahead for you and indeed for your team. Um, so, so let's start with, with the borders uh, this morning, shall we? We heard from the Health Secretary a, a list of new measures to, to, to toughen up uh, at the borders to the United Kingdom. Can you just run us through them? But, but also, just explain exactly why we are, we are doing this at this point in time. Yeah, I guess the first thing to say is it's not about the prevalence of the virus elsewhere now. It's about the variance. Uh, and that's the thing that we're tracking. And that's why we're taking a slightly different approach. But th these are additional things that we're doing on top of things like pre-departure testing that was already required before you travel here from somewhere else and a passenger locator form that you have to fill in by law and you can be thrown off the flight if you if you don't have it. In fact, you won't get onto the flight if you don't have it. But now in addition to that, when you get back here, you must quarantine. Again, that's been in place, but also take mandatory tests on day two and day eight. Uh, and in addition to that, there are a set of countries, we call them the red list countries, 33 of them at the moment, where we're saying um, there should be, uh, in fact, there are no direct flights whatsoever from those countries that haven't been for a while again. But if you are traveling via another route from those countries, then you must quarantine in a hotel. And so that's being introduced as well uh, from Monday. Uh, just in terms of, of the hotel rollouts, of course, clearly there have, there have been some concerns, some questions about how many rooms we have available, how many rooms, in fact, we will need to maintain the system moving forward. I mean, can you, can you give us that detail? Come Monday, how many, uh, well, as of now, how many have we got? How many will we have by Monday? And, and how many do we need given, you know, people are going to be staying in that hotel room, not, not for a handful of days, but for, you know, a week and a half? Sure. Well, first of all, there are over 5,000 hotel rooms. Uh, these are sort of, if you like, government-managed facil facilities, these hotels. There are 5,000 immediately available. Uh, and bear in mind, these are from countries where there are no direct flights at all. A um, majority of Brits will have already returned from those locations. Uh, and very, very few people are travelling at all at this stage, um, 16 to 20,000 a day. And that includes the hauliers who, who bring our goods uh, to this country and other categories like um, sort of border workers. So we're we're down to a very, very small number of people, uh, and we can just increase those numbers very quickly in a day or so uh, because we've got those agreements in place. Uh, can you then just t tell us a little bit more about those those agreements agreements in place? Five five thousand hotel rooms is is a great start, clearly, but with estimates, you know, around about fifteen hundred uh, perhaps visitors arriving from those red list countries every day. It appears that by you know the middle of next week, we we might be getting close to capacity. I, no, I've seen some of those numbers thrown around, and 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 I don't think they're they're, they're correct because um, if you think about the very small number of people who are travelling at the moment, I mean, travel is ninety five percent down on uh, where it was this time uh, last year, uh, and of the remaining people who travel, once you strip out the lorry drivers who are bringing our medicines and foods here, uh, frontier workers, critical you know uh, people who come over to, for example, um, keep our critical infrastructure uh, working, um, actually the number of people. Traveling uh, overall is very low. And then beyond that, we're only talking about another subsection of people who are traveling here from those red list countries uh, where there are no direct flights in any case. So we're talking about a could very you, could small you, could, you put, could you put a, a number then on it? Uh, what, what is the government's estimate well, of well, how even, many people even at the moment, heading into that, the system? Even at the moment, that probably comes to less than a thousand a day. And by next week, when people will have to pay to do this £1,750 package on top of, of course, their costs of getting here via an indirect route, uh, I think we'll find the numbers are actually pretty small. But as I say, either way, uh, it's fine because uh, we can increase hotel numbers very, very quickly. We've got those agreements in place. How do we, as, as a number of colleagues of yours on, on Conservative benches are asking, how do we get out of this? What is the, uh, the, 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 the bar that we need to surpass to start drawing down on these on these travel restrictions. Yeah, I mean, look, I'm transport secretary, so I absolutely want people to be able to travel. But it is a fact that right now it's illegal to leave your home to go on holiday. It's illegal to do that in the UK or um, or around the world. So I'm afraid at the moment that's that's off the cards. Having said that, um, fortunately, I think the the total number of vaccinations injected now is 13.1 million overall. Uh, in this country, which I just checked, actually, is, is more than all of the EU put together in terms of the number of people being um, vaccinated so far. So we're, we're going great guns on that and we're moving very fast. That's a very, very important part of how we get to unlock the situation. And the Prime Minister will make uh, a, a statement about this and say more about it on the 22nd, when he'll be able to set out a sort of route to unlock 
Um, very similar to what happened last year, but of course now, this time, not just with the benefit of seeing the reductions through the lockdown, but also the reductions through vaccine. And I, I should also say through the massive testing programme uh, that's now in place that's enabled us to surge the testing in certain areas where we've seen these variants as well. So we've got a lot more sort of tools in our armoury now. Um, I can't give you an exact date at this stage. The Prime Minister will say more and then we'll have a, a series of dates during which we will be able to gradually unlock things if we see cases continue to reduce and, 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 and deaths as well. For, forgive me if I'm, if, I'm, if I'm wrong here, but it does feel that you seem rather more confident about us getting some form of a summer holiday than, than perhaps even the health secretary. I mean, yesterday, it did rather feel that he was linking us coming out of this uh, significant action on our borders to you know, a booster vaccine come the autumn that might provide that additional protection against the variants. That, let's not forget, are already in the country, despite the action that we're taking right now. Yeah, look, and I don't want to kind of um, unnecessarily raise people's hopes. The truth is, we just don't know how the virus will respond, and both to the vaccines and, of course, how people will respond, and therefore to, to the social distancing and those kind of uh, measures, and therefore exactly when we'll be able to unlock. So I'm afraid I can't give you a definitive. Will there or will there not be the opportunity to take holidays this next year, either at home or abroad? Uh, but what I do know is right now, thanks to people uh, adhering to the, the lockdown, and thanks to the enormous vaccination programme, it's just, just been extraordinary, as I say, more, more than the whole of the rest of the EU put together in terms of injections. Thanks to those two things, uh, we are starting to see those reductions, but I don't know what the situation will be uh, by the middle of the summer. Uh, nobody can tell from the point that we, we, we sit right now. Uh, and so I'm afraid it is sitting tight, observing the rules uh, and waiting for, if you haven't had your injection yet, uh, depending sure, on the sure, category sure. you're in, waiting for that call, unless okay. you're over 70, in which case please do contact uh, your GP or, or go to NHS uh, website. But, in but order if, to this, get if, if this toughening injection. up at the borders was, as you say, to, to do with you know dealing with variants of the virus, variants which, like the South African virus, uh, South African variant may have you know, some form of resistance to the vaccines that we have on stream at the moment. Haven't we somewhat missed the boat? Why has it taken us so long to get to a point where we are testing people arriving in this country after they get into the country? So, so first of all, it's really important, as it's often mis misunderstood, mutations of the virus take place all the time. And there have been thousands of mutations of, of this virus. Most are uh, don't change um, things. They're, they're almost like passengers within the, the virus. They, they come and go. Throughout this uh, coronavirus, there have been many a time um, where uh, the, the level, the, the prevalence, the amount of virus elsewhere um, has been lower uh, than it has been here, and in which case it hasn't really uh, much mattered. In, in, in fact, some some would say, uh, some have argued um, that if it's lower elsewhere, then there's no real concern about people being outside of the country simply for the fact that you have more chance of catching it in the country if our rates were high. What we're facing now is a different issue. What we're facing now isn't about the prevalence, it's about the variance, and that is essential uh, it's essential that we don't allow... The African variant is already here. In. My point, again, was why has it taken us so long to get to this? It's 12 months since we had the first, you know, death recorded from COVID-19. Plenty of other countries have beaten us to the punch, particularly on testing, not before the border, but at or after the border. Why has it taken us so long to catch up with them? The, the number one thing you can do is quarantine or, or, or self-isolate. And of course, we've had that in place since last spring. So we, we and we've had that in place a lot longer than most countries. Uh, we've actually now got a whole suite of different things uh, because of these variants, which make it uh, you know, amongst the, the toughest in the world. It's up there with the way that South uh, Korea and countries who um, have traditionally uh, had a, a much more interventionist approach to uh, these sort of uh, these sort of issues in Southeast Asia, where they've tackled um, viruses in, in the past and these pandemic out outbreaks. But um, the, the reality is, a test, as I've explained many times before, is good and interesting, but not as as in terms of tackling. The uh, the virus not as good as just quarantining on its on its own. So if you were going to do one why, or the why other, have, why have we only why have we only now earlier, introduced hotel quarantine yes. then? Well, to answer I mean, your that's question, been going in Australia and New Zealand since March of last year. Okay, straightforward question: When did the Department for Transport begin working on the policy of hotel quarantine? 
Yeah. So, so hold on, let me just answer your last question and this one as well. Uh, in terms of testing capacity, you'll recall right at the beginning of this crisis, we simply didn't have the capacity to be testing everyone in every situation. We, we started off with less than 2,000 tests a day. Now we've probably got eight or 900,000 available um, to, per day. So that's a very good reason. The other thing about, for example, Australia, which is an example I always hear quoted, Australia is an entire continent. They are uh, pretty self-sufficient in many different ways. The UK, which, for example, through the short straits, that connection between Calais and, and, and Dover, imports 75% of its medicines, 45% uh, of uh, our food. Uh, we, we can't operate without those... No, 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 one has, no one has ever suggested, as far as I'm aware, that we stop, you know, hauliers bringing medicines to the United Kingdom. What plenty of people have suggested is that perhaps we're a little late to, the, uh, late to sorting out, you know, people arriving in the United Kingdom from... Red, you know, countries which are now on the red list. I mean, it's, it has always been described by the government, the, the, the additional action, which has long been trailed, uh, the additional action at our borders was all about toughening up an already robust set of circumstances. Yeah. But, I mean, just look at the, 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 the way in which it is being enforced. You know, up until this point, we've relied largely on civil penalties and people doing their duty. It is not a chain. It is not a toughening up of that to say you could end up in jail for 10 years. That's an entirely new policy. OK, so, so, so look, first of all, um, people have been being checked. Border Force have checked 3.7 million uh, uh, um, passenger locator forms as they've come in. And more recently, of course, with the pre-departure testing, they've checked those as well. Um, so it's not that uh, I, I, keep, I keep hearing people haven't been checked. That, that's not true. However, you are right to say um, that because the variance is a, at a whole different scale to just how prevalent the disease is. I mentioned before, there were many times during... In fact, the entire travel corridor policy was on the basis that where you were travelling to had to, by definition, have lower levels of mm. coronavirus than here. So that, that was a different issue. What we're dealing with now is the variance. And with variance, we cannot risk it in these final stages where we've got the vaccine roll, rolled out, uh, that we might end up with uh, difficulty from, from variations, although we think so far that we'll be able to take care of them through the vaccines. And because of that, we think it's appropriate that you know, things like you know, prison sentences for lying about being in one of those red list countries uh, are, are appropriate. And look, I just don't agree with the idea that we somehow didn't act quickly. I can tell you, within six hours of finding out of one of these variants, this is the mink variant in, in Denmark, we changed the law, possibly a record time for changing the law in this country. So there'd be many occasions where we've had to act extremely... Well, well, well I mean, we could mention, you know, the, the kind of the Kent variant when it hit London and people have been telling you to kind of act on that, you know, a fortnight before you did. But I, I, I do want to no, conclude no, on anything if I can. Sorry, there is sorry. A... Let, me just, let me just pick you up on that because because that's <laughs> this is how these stories get out there and are wrong. The variants occur and we may get a clue about them, but as I said, we, we see a lot of different mutations take, thousands of mutations. What you have to then do is genome sequence them, and that is a process I'm which takes days and weeks. I'm talking about the fact that from action and the government overnight. decided not to do it for a fortnight. That was the point that I was no, no, making. No, no, no. I do, no, I do want to conclude, That's Minister... That's factually I, correct. Fair enough. I do want to conclude, Minister. Um, there's going to be £5 billion worth of grants and loans today to, to get rid of cladding on, on buildings. And, of course, you, you have a, a, a good degree of experience of working in housing. Stephen McPartland, your colleague, says, because, you know, a building's under 18 metres, people will be having to take out loans. He describes it. Uh, millions of leaseholders are facing financial ruin, ruin and will not accept loans. They are not a solution. They are a disgraceful betrayal. I just, just wonder your thoughts on that. Well, look, first of all, I mean, uh, this cladding situation has been, you know, we've all seen the, the impact of it and it's been absolutely horrendous. The, the government's already uh, put in £1.6 billion pounds to um, trying to get the cladding removed. I know that the uh, housing Secretary of State will be saying more this lunchtime. And he's got a statement in the House and we'll have to wait for uh, for that. Um, but there's a, a, a fairly complicated picture because you have leaseholders, uh, but you also have um, sort of joint ownerships. Uh, you sometimes have council ownerships. And I know that uh, Robert Jenrick, the Housing Secretary, wants to get to the bottom of trying to help everybody uh, so that people are not out of pocket. I'm afraid we will have to wait till later uh, to see exactly what he says and how much money is involved. But I think it's a good thing the government is standing by behind uh, people in that position.